excited to be here presenting our paper entitled Shifting to Second, the Successful Treatment of Regurgitation with Reinforcement Variety Using Secondary Reinforcers. Well, this is our princess, Maya. She actually chose this pink background. And in 2012, she was a seven-year-old lactating female with a chronic regurgitation issue. Regurgitation was first observed in 2009, presumably a learned behavior from her big sister, Indy, who was a frequent poolmate. As far as her detrimental side effects, physically she had low weight, tooth decay, stomach ulcerations, and esophageal erosion. Behaviorally, she had no food motivation. Her overall criteria was significantly lower than the rest of our collection, and she had a perpetual lack of interest in all sessions, whether it be shows, guest interactions, or new behavior training. Now this presented challenges for our staff because there was a lot of pressure to get food into her in order to keep her satiated, but very little acceptable behavior to actually reinforce. Plus the combination of her lowered criteria and lack of motivation created trainer frustration, which ultimately led to a lot of behavioral breakdown. Previously, she had been medicated with Valium to try and stimulate her appetite. She was also medicated for her stomach issues with Carifate, Cimidine, and Prilosec due to uh, esophageal reflux causing tissue breakdown. Satiation was proving to be ineffective, so because of her low weight despite satiation and the high caloric demands of nursing her calf, we decided to impl implement a new behavioral modification treatment plan in July of 2012. So our objective was to shift reinforcement value from primary, specifically food, to dozens of secondaries. We hypothesized that decreasing her motivation to uh, regurgitate, excuse me, <laughs> decreasing the value of food would decrease her motivation to regurgitate and improve her behavioral attitude. We also felt confident that having a vast diversity of reinforcers would motivate her to participate. So our methods, in order to maintain consistency, we immediately reduced the number of trainers working her from 12 to two. We changed our positive reinforcement sequence. We began conditioning dozens and dozens of secondaries. And we began to remove focus from failure and we designed all of our sessions to be variable and highly unpredictable. Now we changed our reinforcement sequence so that correct behavior was no longer fed. However, it did still receive a bridge. So our new, or excuse me, our new sequence went correct behavior, bridge, secondary reinforcement, and then primary reinforcement. Now this was very difficult to retrain ourselves to keep our hands out of the buckets. And fortunately, we have this guy around to give us a hand. <laughs> Stop! Don't feed that animal. I have secondary reinforcement. <laughs> dozens and dozens of secondaries and we dedicated entire sessions to this process. So we would present a new object and ask her to touch it with her rostrum, touch it with her peck, and then bridge and feed any interest she emitted. She very quickly showed us which ones were more intrinsically reinforcing, which ones would require some learning, and which ones were just straight up aversive. If we found a, an object to be aversive, we did avoid using it. We're going to cue a video here. This is our trainer Stephanie using the noodle, and you can hear Maya's reaction. And I'm using the construction cone over the bridge. And then using the cone to funnel some pressure onto her mallet. And then this is an antibacterial foam that we use on abrasions, but she really seemed to enjoy the foam on her mallet as well as the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> now, the uh, same object might elicit a different response in a different context. 
For example, my targeting to the noodle did appear to be reinforcing, but slapping around the melon with the noodle was definitely a magnitude. Uh, then we have uh, water play, and we presented water play in many different forms, uh, syringes, hoses, water guns, uh, amongst many others. Uh, we also found that water pressure on different areas of her body to be more reinforcing, her mouth in particular. Water pressure has proved to be a very strong motivator. So we'll cue this video. This is Allison. She has a small funnel. You can see, you can hear a quiet reaction. syringe here and you can really get pretty pumped about it. And then Allison has a colander that she's using over my flutes. You'll see my circle back round. She really did seek out that water pressure in her mouth. And then attention uh, has increased and evolved dramatically. Uh, we will give her back rubs and belly rubs in layouts. We will poke her face multiple times, cover her eyes, give her high fives, and she really seems to enjoy it when we poke her pet pit. <laughs> Touching her mouth is also a very high value reinforcer. Now, as we have, uh, as we have improved our ability to use these uh, reinforcers more efficiently, we've relied very heavily on these tactile reinforcers because they have a very high value and they are always available. And we can cue this video and we'll see me give her some mouth tension. Alright, you guys can come back to the line. And I'm drumming my fingers on a melon. Covering her eyes. Touching with my toes. And then some more mouth tension. So while we have spent a lot of time, time finding ways to motivate Maya, we've also focused on changing her attitude towards failure. We began taking focus off of incorrect behavior by delivering an LRS and repeating the behavior one time. If the behavior is still incorrect, the LRS was again delivered and we moved on to a different behavior. Previously, Maya had a tendency to work harder to get an established behavior wrong. Our response to correct behavior was predictably food, something that did not motivate her. However, our responses to her incorrect behaviors were novel and much more motivating. We had spent a significant portions of, portions of sessions working through incorrect responses of established behaviors with timeouts and approximations. Consequently, a lot of attention was brought to these failures and sessions became presumably aversive for Maya and certainly aversive for her trainers. Uh, we also gave her more crutches and focused more on uh, setting her up for success. SDs were always very big and clear, and she would get uh, target help for pattern behaviors more often. Uh, we were not trying to prevent her from failing, just trying to increase her overall percentage rate of success by giving her help in certain behaviors that, while established, had proven to be problematic. And then we designed all of our sessions to be variable and highly unpredictable. Now, our uh, training sessions were relatively easy to make unpredictable, and our show has a template that allows for variability by design. But our public encounter program demands that each guest receive the exact same interaction experience. So how do we keep this from becoming predictable? Well, we can change the direction of our dorsal toe perimeter, we can vary locations of mimics between deep water and shallow water, and we can change the order of behavior. So for example, not instead of doing six handshakes in a row, we can do one handshake, one mimic, two layouts, one dorsal toe, and then come back to another handshake. We added a second trainer to plan and track this variable order. They could also focus on the guest to maintain guest satisfaction, while the primary trainer focused on Maya. This also added more variability with the option of a control change at any point. Instead of doing a 20 minute inter interaction straight through, we could break it up into two or even three smaller sessions by having the guests exit the water at variable intervals. And depending on the able-bodiedness of the guests, we could have them slide in from deck or even cannonball into deep water instead of just always using the stairs. 
And then we could also have the animals switch sides of the habitat mid-interaction. And this gave uh, both animals six fresh guest faces for the second half of their session. Now this was challenging for our trainers because we had to consciously think of which secondary to use next in order to maintain a sufficient level of variability. For example, not getting into the habit of always using the cone or always using the noodle. And then we have our ongoing challenge of what we call fighting the rut. Uh, this is our constant struggle to avoid getting comfortable in a pattern that we know to be successful with Maya and successful with guests. As soon as she begins to recognize a pattern, we see a backside in behavior and an increase in regurgitation. Basically, we begin to lose control. So we will all eternally continue to fight the rut and challenge ourselves to stay outside of our comfort zone. So the top graph is Maya's weight. The bottom graph uh, are the monthly average KCALs that we offered her. And these arrows will indicate where we began treatment. Since implementing treatment in July of 2012, Maya has gained weight while we have continued to decrease her KCALs. Thus, more nutrition is being utilized. This correlation definitively indicates that Maya is regurgitating less and that our treatment has been effective. There has also been a dramatic change in her daily participation. In 2012, she averaged 0.3 shows a day and 1.2 encounters. In 2013, she is averaging 1.4 shows a day and 2.5 encounters. Now the quality of these sessions is anecdotal because we have implemented a new rating system this summer, so there is no way to objectively compare the quality of her sessions between 2012 and 2013. However, uh, our entire staff unanimously agrees that the quality of her behavior and her attitude have dramatically improved. <coughs> now, her health has also improved enough that we have been able to remove all of her gastrointestinal medications. Now, anecdotally, Maya's overall behavioral criteria has significantly improved. Her bowels are three to four feet higher, and she now tail walks the entire length of our main show habitat. Even her smaller at-station behaviors like vocals and imitates have greater duration. From high energy to calm attention, Maya's criteria now matches the rest of our collection. We are no longer fish dispensers. This process has changed how our entire staff interacts with our collection. Trainers now focus on which secondaries motivate each individual animal. They spend time sampling and developing new secondaries and in the process, create stronger relationships. Now, the relationships that have developed between Maya and her trainers have been such a tremendous side effect from this process. We all know her so much better because we spend so much time and energy figuring out what she wants and what makes her tick. We authentically love interacting with Maya. Conversely, Maya appears to genuinely enjoy her trainers when only a year ago, she appeared to be completely indifferent. One of our interns asked our owner, Dan Blasco, do we have an enrichment budget? To which Dan answered, yes, I call it payroll. <laughs> we, the trainers, are now the ultimate reinforcement because we bring our dolphins all of these other wonderful things. As Dan would say, we make the sun rise in the east and set in the west for our dolphins. Uh, the best part of this process is illustrated in this video. With no food or toys and with almost no bridging, Maya is just stoked to be hanging out with Sam. Since each individual's motivation to regurgitate is unique, 
The likelihood of success is increased if more treatment options are available. This method was successful for my situation where the traditional method of satiation failed. It should be shared with all in hopes that it may help others find success with an alternative treatment. We are never done learning. Each animal's motivation is a moving target, so we must be aware and make changes in how we reinforce accordingly. There will always be a new way to reinforce an animal, and with this in mind, we should constantly strive to be creative with our animal interactions. We should all continue to fight the rut for each individual's quality of life, because the ha healthy health and happiness of our animals are the foundation of everything we do. Oh, we, uh, we would like to say thank you to the animal care and training staff at Gulf World, to our veterinarian, uh, Dr. Skaggs, Secret Homes, and the man, Dan Blasco, for giving us all of the guidance and support, and of course, our beautiful girl, Maya. Thank you.